So I know, you know, what I'm gonna, what I will intend to um, hope to do in these Q and A. So please feel free to um, ask questions. If there's something burning that you want to get started with, we can start with a question from the audience. Oh, Ben's already on his get going. Brilliant. Um, I'll just bring the mic down. Hello, yeah, Ben Richards from uh, Newcastle University School of Architecture. Uh, thanks for the presentation, it's absolutely fantastic and um, thought provoking. I was very pleased, Phil, you ended talking about um, the sort of design, construction, completion cycle. I've been thinking about this a lot recently and how that's a sort of fundamentally flawed way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Buildings should be the sort of continual of habitation, growth, and decay, and um, repair, and modification. Um, but what I thought was interesting was, I think computer modeling and computer simulation and um, those tools have sort of led more and more in that direction where everything gets specified endlessly. So then I thought it was interesting with your response to this more sort of complex way of having things change through time, is that we need more advanced computer modeling. We need to model complex systems, we need to model, model everything. Um, and my question really is, do you think we need to model everything? And I suppose there's this feeling that we need to control everything, perhaps, which is this old idea of people, man controlling nature, or actually you need to take a step back from the digital technology to craftsmanship, to local materials, to sharing skills, and to letting nature get on with what nature does and just accepting all the complex ecosystems that many people to simulate and actually just let them, you know, inhabit our buildings or live within nature. And sort of see how it goes without actually simulating. That's an exquisite question. Um, I, I, I don't think it's a choice of either or. Um, my practice, I think, is about trying to involve both. Um, one, one of the things that I would say uh, I've become very conscious of, particularly through the Fundal Architectures project, um, and also being in a, a research environment and a research community is very much engaged in kind of, um, looking at advanced industrial technologies. Um, one of the things that I, I've started to become very interested in through the Congo Architectures Project is looking at the two fundamental technologies we're working with. One is weaving and one is fermentation. Um, and I think the way I'm trying to develop a, um, a design practice is to say, uh, aren't I fortunate to be in a very privileged position to be able to make use of advanced industrial technologies for inquiry, uh, but not to make the making of the things that we're developing predicated on the use of those advanced industrial technologies. So this is where um, we, we can start to kind of understand things about um, tuning material performance through protocols of steaming and compression. And start to gain very deep insights into material performance. But ultimately, when we get onto the ground, we can, we can give that out. It becomes a technology that can be appropriated by anyone in any condition, in any situation, as long as they have the, the, the key resources, which are not advanced industrial resources or advanced industrial materials, um, and, and, and feel empowered that they can actually move from something. Uh, a set of skills that they can learn from a craft basis uh, and actually empower themselves to make um, environments locally themselves. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's an either or. I think from, from a position that, it, the privileged position that we're in, uh, it should be about using the two, but with a focus towards um, empowerment rather than perhaps concentrations of capital. Um, towards you know, great, greater technological prowess. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, any, any other questions? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, amazing presentations, really mind blowing for the morning. Um, I was thinking, like, jump on, jumping on the question of him. Do you think uh, artificial intelligence could be made also together with your practices and both in micro and macro context of architecture and products? Um, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure they could. Uh, it's not something I, I particularly deal with. Um, 
you know, th there is a lot of artificial intelligence you know, being investigated in, in our particular uh, research center. Um, you know, ultimately, it seems that you know, with, with AI, you're either, you know, the, the, the key thing here is that defining the problem. You know, are you looking at a classification problem or are you looking at a, 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 a kind of um, model fitting problem? Um, you know, I, per, personally, I haven't engaged with it that much. Um, I, I can see, um, I, I can see some of our researchers also developing a certain kind of critique to, to its its kind of validity within the context they're working with it. But uh, I mean, e equally, I think you know, it's it's there. Um, we should have people researching and, and critically, you know, finding out what its value can be. Um, I, I wouldn't say that we should ignore it. I mean, I guess uh, what I really wanted to pick up on um, from the presentation is actually to go back to your final slide of the image of the Mississippi mm -hmm. and thinking about that river and the way it's meandering and you know, changing its form. And I think this kind of, in terms of what you're both talking about and bringing in these kind of super new kind of emerging technologies and then craft processing, and thinking about this idea of an architect that meanders through. Uh, both space and time, and I wonder if you have any kind of response response to that. I think you know, the importance of maybe where where this, you know where these technologies come in and where um, kind of time offers us this this moment to reflect, but also to move forward. Maybe with what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I think Owen's. Um, Notion of looking back to look forward is, is really fantastic. So, I mean, I, I pointed towards an idea about John So. Of course, you know, the image of the ruin is a very powerful architectural emblem. And I'm not suggesting that everything needs to look ruinous and we need to walk around looking like Romans, um, like, like Joseph Michael Gandhi was depicting the, the British <laughs> occupants. Um, yeah, that, that, that we, we, we can think about you know, other, other modes of um, architecture and architectural states. Uh, again, I don't think we need to necessarily try and think that there's a void of conceptualization around this. Um, there, there's a very interesting book called Building to Last by Herbert Green, who was one of the Oklahoma Five, um, built this incredible tiny little house with his students. Uh, called the Prairie House, which you know, is really worth taking a look at. It's an exquisite piece of architecture. But um, his, his, his book was about developing a concept of armature architecture. And the idea of an armature architecture is, is one where you've got the kind of architectural infrastructure that can last for a long time, but you've got an idea about um, the possibility of the, the kind of current cultures being able to leave their mark within it and to make adjustments. Um, and I, I think this is you know, a really interesting idea. Um, and then I arrived in Newcastle and I started to walk around. And I thought, oh my God, Newcastle is an armature city. Right? So you're wandering around, you come across you know, these amazing pockets of things that you know, have been developed or you know, have fallen into a state of waiting to be developed. There's kind of lines of historical record. Of, you know, it, it's, it, it feels to me like a, a really nice example of what Herbert Green was talking about in terms of this kind of idea of an armature architecture. Um, and, it, and it talks about a, a very interesting, uh, I think deeply anti-modern idea. Uh, you know, the modernist idea is about sweep away. Um, what we have now is best. We can we can get rid of everything else, uh, rather than having a kind of you know uh, a, a kind of humility and also um, wanting to preserve a link with the past, where we think about kind of adding additional overlays um, that, that kind of become a, a kind of enriched crust that we can occupy. I don't know the enriched crews. Um, I mean, of course, think back on that point about Newcastle, there, there was a certain attempt to 
more or less wipe away the city center and we have fragments of that, which is I think one of the ways you know makes it, it it's so interesting that, that there's that kind of fragmentary attempt at the wholesale uh regeneration of, of the of the entire city center. Um I mean just sort of coming back to, to um your 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 original question. I mean um and and that that amazing image. I mean, again, I haven't, haven't seen it before the, of the meandering Mississippi. And I think the point that you made was that this is where documenting this the profound change, you know, fundamental changes of, of roots, but it was still familiar. It was still recognizably the Mississippi River. And partly has to do with it changes gradually, and you know, the, the image is showing that at that, that time and scale compressed. Massively, but it but it it, it, it made me think and again something that, that, that Ben mentioned bringing up you know the sort of the tyranny of, of, of the, the BIM model and that world we live in. Um and myself um, having been a client on or still the client of the crowd and the building project, I'm getting a kind of glimpse of how these things work. I mean, fundamentally, the BIM model is about removing risk and uncertainty from the from the construction uh, process. Um, and which, which you know, um, reflects the way buildings are procured and the finances um, behind them. Well, it's quite interesting as well the, the, the way that um, so much architecture is, and, and not, not just on the technical side, but the kind of formal cultural side is, is conceived in a similar way to remove risk from the equation. I showed that housing estate um, of the and houses that all look exactly the same, all with pitched roofs. And that is similarly a reflection of the developer wanting to de risk how they design the formal qualities they use because they know that people, you know, there's a certain idea that exists. You know, I don't know if it's not a platonic ideal of a house or not, if it is, it's a rather distorted one of, you know, front door, pitched roofs, um, maybe even sash windows. And they don't want to deviate from that because it's risky uh, uh, to do so. But I think what what we kind of need to find ways of happening is is to, is to um, expand that in a sense to recognise that familiarity is is vital. Familiarity is vital to how we architecture. It's how we form a sense of place and belonging, attachments to particular areas. But at the same time, it can't be then used to to smother the possibility of using new formal. Uh, devices using new new materials, new ways of working. So it's it's there's there's that kind of thing of, of how can you keep something familiar but at the same time push it forward. Uh, which I don't know what the answer is to how to do that, but it's, it seems that is the essential conundrum that that that, that um that, that we're facing in a sense. Yeah, and working in the with the materials we're working with and the ideas we're working with actually. That's a key issue for us, isn't it? How do, we, um, how do we bring the public and along with us into this kind of new and, and the, the building construction industry, which is you know, it's, it's the ways it works are so heavily entrenched that it's you know it's a very long journey that one would need to take people on. Um, you know, our building project, you know, the amount of plasterboard that's used in it is quite staggering. Mastic has like a budget line for itself, which I was kind of staggered by. Um, you know, th this is this is how buildings are made, and and you know systems and process to step up, and how one begins to um, change that is is I, I don't know. That's the new one though. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I mean, it, you know, it's just that it, um, you know, one of the kind of underlying themes of uh, this event is about the living. Um, you know, that suggests a completely different mode of construction and assembly and material sourcing. Um, but I'm, I'm going to pivot a little bit and perhaps kind of um, observe what I, I think is a kind of elephant in the room, um, even though we're, we're a third way in. So, um, of course, you know, we're all talking about the living, but if we raise the idea of the living 
we need to be conceptualizing how to deal with death. Um, and I mean, that was also kind of provoked by you putting the picture of the Trinity up, Rogier's frontest piece there, where you see um, the living trees acting as the columns, and then you see the dead wood creating the truss. Um, it isn't that death needs to be thought about in a negative way. It can also be you know, a tremendous way of creating resource. Um, we can also think about death at multiple scales and you know, how it's absolutely critical to biological development. And it's, it's how we develop our dishes. And cells die, and that's what starts to kind of create the possibility of the growth of the finger and the toes. So um, you know, it, it feels like we need to kind of be um, also starting to understand how it is that we might be firstly conceptualizing that as part of our practices. Um, also engaging in how it is that we can model that if we're using modeling methods. Um, and also how it is that you know, that manifests itself in the kind of materials that we're, we're producing. Okay. Romy, is that? I feel there was some sensing, so maybe. Question. Question. Um, <laughs> it's actually to the point that Owen said before. It's from Sarah Kathy. And first of all, she thanks you both for the two brilliant talks. Um, and then she's interested in how this also suggests that we need to shift how we value thinking and experience, um, and therefore also how we value this in research. So also more towards um, rendering as a way of knowing as an anti-modern value system for knowledge, and especially she's thinking about, in particular, the criteria for good research in the UK, like richer origin, originality and significance. If someone has an opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe just, just the idea about you know, how, how this kind of work might contribute to kind of shifting values. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of discussion uh, about this, you know, also from economy, and I'm, I'm thinking about the work, particularly of someone like uh, Juan Martinez Ayer, um, who's been conceptualizing you know, notions of degrowth for, for many, many years, and you know, is, is really advocating for a, a fundamental change in society's values and the, the value systems that underpin economics. And so he, he's, he points to this idea that you know, currently. You know, we, we, we value private investment. We value the consumption in more rather than better. Um, we, we value um, man-made capital over natural capital. And, and ultimately, these three kind of reinforcing elements are fed by a sole interest in, um, I think the word he used is crematistic growth. So crematistic meaning you know, essentially down to money. Um, and you know, just, I mean, it is it's such a perceptive piece of writing. Um, and, and then it is just, you know, he just begins to unfold how, you know, what, what, where is it that we've lost the idea that we might have other more empathetic values towards what we're aiming for? Right? So this idea of deep growth starts to, I, I think it's perhaps an unfortunate term because D puts it into a kind of what is seen, I think, generally as negative. But uh, I think you know, maybe it's about the idea of you know, trying try to reach um, different kinds of equilibria um, where uh, we start to value uh, things that have long been left behind, you know, like social cohesion, like community, like, you know, and the growth of empathy amongst us. Uh, the, the, the growth of greater interconnectedness, the growth of um, re reconnection due to the, 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 um, the fragmentations that we've been you know, inflicting upon, upon the earth. Um, so you know, I, I think, I think we're, we're right for, for new values. You know, the question is, how, how is it through, through our practices that we can contribute? And who, who do we have to um, essentially uh, build communities with beyond our practices to start to make this, you know, a much wider felt um, movement. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's ironic that we have a Prime Minister, I don't want to get too political about this, but we have a Prime Minister's mandate, growth, 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 
I understand it, uh, which may very well expose growth for all the things that you've actually talked about, the, the fact that even if growth is achieved in the next two years before the general election, it may not be felt particularly, and actually maybe that focus will open up a much more of a space of thinking beyond economic growth in the conventional sense it may it may allow some of these more richer ways of, of thinking um, about about progress ultimately uh, to to come to the fore. So yes, in a funny way, although it seems immensely depressing, there may as a result of it, I wonder if I'm being extremely naive about this in utopia, but that there may be a possibility that as a result of this, it's it's kind of final exposure for the one-dimensional nature it is may create space for something else. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, you, you paint a, a depressing picture there. But yeah. I think mean, your 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 what your the depression that you're contouring is the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Um so you know I If we look at that kind of image of the meandering, uh, the meandering Mississippi, okay. So, so there are other things that meander a lot, and, and this gets back into some some of the kind of complexity modeling that I was referring to. You know, so so modeling things like populations, um, looking at the modeling of um, dare I raise this uh, mass extinction events. Right. So you know, there's, a, there's a kind of understanding that perhaps across the um, record there have been five mass extinction events. Some people argue for more. This depends on what the metrics are that we look at. But essentially, you know, mass extinction is defining you know, a, a rapid decrease in biodiversity. And you look at the mass extinction event, the five major ones, and you're, you're looking at biodiversity drops of about 90 to 95 percent. And then and then they start to climb up again. Um, the WWF has just released a report uh, that says over the last 50 years we have lost 70% of biodiversity. And if that is not, you know, we are on the slide of the mass extinction event, I don't know what is. Um, they point to that in America, where they're saying there's 94% lost biodiversity. So that is actually within a mass extinction event, you know, moment. Um, so I mean, you know, we, we, I, I think you know, we, we kind of conceptualize things about how we can put the brakes on and how we can you know start to kind of try and shift the curves back. But I think we're going to go through a period of you know really quite extreme um, difficulty over the coming years. Um, and then, and then you can begin to kind of link that then to kind of population. So you do population modeling. And of course, there's a kind of ideal logistic growth model that kind of takes you up in an exponential way. And then you hit the carrying capacity and the population kind of reaches a very nice equilibrium. Um, I mean, the reality is tend to be that you know, things go through boom and bust. Um, and then, you, you know, I, I look at, the mapping of the human population and go, well, we've been going up. That's at some point we're going to have to go down. Um, and you know, that's going to drive like really major built environment problems, right? You know, mass migrations, um, you know, and many other things. And you know, the, the question there becomes, you know, how is it as we as designers and what we build might also be able to kind of support some of the um, social um, consequences that, that derive from that? Um, it feels to me like textiles really would actually be part of a, a solution space, um, not least also because of their you know, their pan-cultural influence, the fact that we already had such a familiarity with them, they're an embedded part of our cultures. Um, and also, you know, if we have the right kinds of support structures around them, the way they can actually become focus points for social cohesion. It feels to me like you know, as, as, we, as we move into these kind of more challenging times, social cohesion is going to be 
one of the key things that we need to concentrate on. I just really want to quickly, before we talk to the end of our time, see if there are any other questions from either the chat or the audience. Thank you. I find the, the both talks absolutely fascinating. My name is Mackenzie, and I'm an artist working at the Provide Technology and Build Environment. Um, I suppose I'm tying up and thinking about all the things that you've been saying, and then um, the rather depressing picture of uh, human overgrowth and um, capitalism meaning that everything is going to come crashing down around our ears at some point. Um, and in, in thinking and reflecting on these new technologies and the ways in which we can um, develop materials, but then coming back to the more craft-based ideas, I suppose my question is around, do we think that perhaps looking into this trajectory that we have towards us, which doesn't paint a very pretty picture, Perhaps the investment should be more into skills and building knowledge of how to work with materials in new ways at a more localized or um, essentially hand and back to basics level. Should the investment be more in skills than in materials and new technologies? Yeah, uh, uh, another great question. I, I, I think it kind of harks, harks back to, to your question, some ways. Yeah, I, I, I think you're offering an either or, and I, I, I see it as a both end. Um, I, I see the fact that, um, um, you know, look, looking at the history of textile technologies that have been fundamental to human development, um, you know, I, I see that they have such deep reservoirs of potential innovation. Um, and, and using technology as a way to achieve real, you know, to, to, and, and, and to mind that in innovation. Um, and I, I don't see that it has to be exclusive of engaging with craft. So, you know, I, I go back to the fact that, you know, um, in our privileged position back in Denmark with the fact that we have advanced industrial technologies to our hand, um, I'm, I'm using them, but I'm making sure that the kind of architectural systems that we produce aren't then predicated at the point of production on those advanced industrial technologies. And so they allow for the, the, the kind of um, craft use, the idea of uh, the recently, the recent um, acquisition of weaving skill to be able to make an architecture, um, but you know, to, to have got to the point of inventing that has perhaps required um, the use of technologies to be able to, to make it manifest. I suppose I'm thinking more about the, as well, about the, um, the, the fact that the construction industry is so lagging behind in, in this, and do we need to be, how, you know, how can architectures think about new skills? Perhaps it's really good. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, it's not just the building construction, it, you know, it's insurance. I <laughs> mean, that fundamentally, you know, they won't let you do certain things. Um, and if you can't insure something, then it's worthless. So, um, Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of new, new skills, well, I, I, yeah. I, what, what I'll tell you why you get very thought. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, can, I can point, I mean, I'm going to be quite critical of some of our community. Um, uh, so I was recently at a, 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 a conference and um, I, I could see the opposite happening to what they're talking about, which is. Um, and I, I came away thinking what, what's happening here is the use of technology to perform a kind of digital colonialization by the architect over craft skill. Um, and I, I, I was thoroughly disappointed. Um, so you, what, what you had is this situation where you know, you're, you're getting 
the skilled bricklayer to come and lay bricks. They've got to wear a, you know, an AV kit. Uh, they've got to mount a display, a huge display, and with all the hardware, all the software. You've got to have somebody standing next to you holding a camera that looks a bit like an endoscope looking at your work. Uh, and through the AAR, um, there's this map of exactly where the brick needs to be placed. And all it was missing was essentially a cattle prod. You know, the, the brick layer when, when it wasn't going right. And I was just thinking, you know, that there's, and, and, and ultimately what ended up was, you know, you had um, a decorative wall with, you know, beautiful undulations. Right? Uh, but I was kind of thinking, what exactly is the value proposition? And what exactly does this do in terms of an idea of empowering the person, the class person who's actually there? I mean, it, essentially it's a disempowering. That's why I refer to it as a kind of digital colonialization. Because you know the, the idea of their kind of craft interest, their judgments, their you know, and, and in fact, what's happening is it's actually a, a burdening of their tasks because you've got all this additional technology that you they have to implement to actually achieve this. And I, I was thinking, you know, so, so maybe, maybe I'm answering your question through kind of the ant antithetical aspect. Um, but you know, I, I came away thinking, you know, we, we really need to be very, very critical about you know, how it is that we're using technologies in a way that aren't, um, I suppose, taking capitalist ideas to their ultimate realization, which is about concentration of capital, and, and but not with the purpose of. I absolutely can't speak for yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's really fascinating. I, mean, I, I completely agree with all of that. I think on, on the other hand, however, you know, the architects, their role has never been more curtailed than it is now. You know, architects have you know a tiny amount of the influence that they had um, societally and politically, you know, within the, the, the building construction industry than they had 50, 60 years ago. Some people might say that's a very good thing. Uh, I, I don't think it is. <laughs> um, and so, you know, architects, you know, I've organized um, so many talks, you know, a panel of architects talking about housing and all the things you can do to improve housing. But ultimately, it's a sort of circular argument because no one who actually has any influence to change things is in that room because architects don't have that, that power. Unfortunately, you know, it's in, it's in the building industry, it's in uh it's in government um so there needs to be i think fundamentally in place working as an architect and does some of that things of, of of breaking down those distinctions between design construction and use i think we need to fundamentally get away from that and that needs to be thought of holistically and or, or as a purpose of a cycle um and you know in terms of what that actually means for for architects as i think it's time to find ways to bypass the existing system, working directly with um, communities in collaborative ways, rather than that traditional architect client relationship, working um, together on, on projects and similarly working um, like that with, um, with contractors. So it's, it's not, it's not, you know, design is produced, it gets built, it gets used, but it's, it's a kind of constant, uh, Process where there isn't ever this kind of fixed entity that can, you know, people walk away from both the art code and magazine and people that that to uh, uh, make the best of it. Thank you so much. I'm really sorry, but we're going to, we, we are going to have to stop there. We've kind of we've just started something really interesting to discuss. So we'll have you carry on the discussion over coffee. Um, and thank, uh, yeah, I mean, just. Thank our panel very much. It's actually been a fantastic morning and hopefully you can catch up at the break if you've got more questions. So thank you. Thank you.